first class of protein ligand interactions, this module five, we will be discussing the several methods involved in protein ligand binding and work out some problems related to the discussions that we had considered in the previous lectures of this module. In these discussions, we will be looking at the bindings of ligands to a macromolecule, which is what our protein ligand binding is all about, and look at some specific plots, the scattered plot and the hill plot, with specific examples of how they may be calculated and how they may be understood further. The association and dissociation constants are something that we looked at in the previous classes. Methods to identify protein ligand binding, where we realize that we need a methodology to find out the protein ligand binding complex concentration or the free protein or the free ligand left after binding to be able to get some meaningful information about the protein ligand complex and how the reaction or how the interaction proceeded. We understood that the prerequisite for binding, similar to an enzyme substrate complex formation, which we will see later, requires diffusion and collision. In this specific case of a protein ligand bound together, we realize that with the proper orientation and the proper proximity, and we would have this binding, the initial collisions will have to occur to form this specific complex. When we are working with enzyme and substrate, we realize that this is the enzyme and this our substrate that has to bind to the specific pocket for a reaction to take place. In our molecular diffusion and understanding that when we look at a protein ligand solvent system, we have the diffusion of the molecules, the diffusion of the solvent molecules, and we looked at how this may occur, and we want a fruitful collision for a specific interaction to occur, and in an enzyme substrate complex for a specific catalytic reaction to occur. So the binding that we look at in the collisions with the large molecules, with the small water molecules, can affect the entropy and the enthalpy of the situation of the ligand binding, and we realized that we needed a spontaneous free energy for a spontaneous change in the free energy to result in a fruitful protein ligand interaction. So we have our solvent molecules, we have our ligand molecules, and our protein molecules, and they have to come together to give us a specific complex formation. Now, with the binding, we see there are different levels of binding. The different levels are such that we could have the binding sites on the protein that are all equivalent and independent of each other. This could require cooperativity of heterogeneity. We will look at cooperativity in this lecture. And then later on, when we have a special lecture on hemoglobin and myoglobin binding to oxygen, probably the most important protein ligand interaction known. In cooperativity, we have all the binding sites that are equivalent, but they are not independent of each other. And in heterogeneity, we have all binding sites that are independent, but not equivalent. As we look at heterogeneity and cooperativity, therefore, we can have all binding sites that are not equivalent and not independent of each other either. So this gets from a simple situation to a gradually difficult and a very complex situation in understanding protein ligand binding altogether. In a lot of studies, the N-methyl acetamide which is a monocarboxylic acid amide, that is an N-methyl derivative of acetamide. So this is the N-methyl derivative of acetamide. The reason why this is chosen for a lot of studies is that the dimerization of this molecule, of this compound, is a model system to study 
the dipeptide, as you can see, the C double bond ONH that gives us interpeptide hydrogen bonds in proteins. That is the important measure to understand their interaction. So this is sometimes used as a model in many studies. If we look at the specific problem related to this, and we have data for the dimerization equilibrium constant K and the enthalpy of dimerization in various solvents. And we would like to see the hydrogen bonding capability in these solvents. So we look at the solvent. We can see we have carbon tetrachloride, dioxane, and water. And these are the equilibrium constants in the different media. We have from the equilibrium constants, we can determine the free energy, the change in free energy. And from a knowledge of the values of our enthalpy changes, we can find out the corresponding entropy changes. So we can fill in the missing data and suggest the role of the hydrogen bonding in biomolecular interactions by considering the spontaneity of the reaction in terms of when we calculate using our delta G zero that is equal to our minus RT ln K. What we have here is our K value. We have our delta G value. So we can actually look at the dimerization procedure which gives us our delta G zero is equal to minus RT ln K. And we know that this K is a measure of the law of mass action applied to this particular set. So when we look at a delta G, we know it is delta H minus T delta S. So the delta S can be given by a small rearrangement giving us this value. And we know that T is 25 degrees centigrade. So we can calculate our values and we can fill up the table. And based on the table, we can look at the delta G zero values and determine what hydrogen bonding aspect would be considered for this particular dimerization reaction. And so this suggests that when we have polar solvents, the hydrogen bonding is unfavorable. So this is an indication that we can look at the way we would study reactions such as these in the determination of free energy changes, enthalpy changes, and entropy changes. In the equilibrium dialysis experiment, we will look at a problem, problem related to this. We learned that we have a specific dialysis bag that is permeable to specific molecular weight. We have this bag that has a specific molecular weight cutoff, allowing any molecule that has a molecular weight less than the cutoff of the dialysis bag to pass freely through the membrane. So outside the dialysis bag, we only have free ligand and the free ligand concentration outside the dialysis bag, we have to remember, is equivalent to the free leg ligand inside the bag because the ligand does not see the ba bag at all and considers that we have an equal concentration of the free ligand throughout. However, inside we have a protein ligand complex formed and this protein ligand complex will not be allowed to leave the bag considering that the molecular weight is high enough to be retained in the bag. So based on an experiment like this, if we get the data where we have in the dialysis bag, the protein plus the ligand, we have a total protein concentration. We have a total ligand concentration. And from that, we have outside the dialysis bag, which indicates that is only the ligand, we have a ligand concentration of 3.6 into 10 to the minus 8. So understanding now that we can determine the amount of protein that is free, the amount of ligand that is free, and probably amount of protein ligand complex that has been formed, given that we know the concentrations and we are able to determine the concentrations. So we have the protein concentration, the ligand concentration, and we know that the total protein concentration has to be whatever is 
bound to the ligand and whatever is free. So, based on the ligand concentration and again the ligand concentration is what is bound to the protein and what is free. And we have this information available to us. The free ligand given by the concentration outside the dialysis bag tells us that we have the amount of ligand bound to the protein. From that, we can determine the free protein and based on that, we can determine our K, our association constant. So this gives us an information about from methodologies that are going to be used to determine the free concentrations of the ligand or the protein or the protein ligand complex, we will be able to determine the association constants which we are interested in. Similarly, if we have an example where we look at a protein of interest that is analyzed using several experiments and it is found to have now three identical subunits and we find that ATP co-purifies with the protein. So we have a specific assumption that each subunit has a binding site for the ligand and an experiment is conducted where a specific concentration of the protein is put into the dialysis bag and the dialysis is put in, the bag is put into a solution containing ATP. Now we have to identify how much of the ATP is going to be bound to the protein. So based on this, we wait for reaching equilibrium. This is extremely important because we are finding out the association constants in the assumption that the reaction has reached equilibrium. So we find out that the concentration of ATP is 3 to 10 to the minus inside the bag and a concentration outside the bag. Assuming that the binding sites are identical, we can find out the association constant for the ligand binding to a single site. So we look at the ATP bound, that is ATP in minus ATP out, given by the ATP concentrations that can be determined. And from that, we can look at our scattered plot, find out the number of ligands bound to the total molecule, uh, the macromolecule concentration present. So this is the concentration of the ligand bound to the total protein present. And from that, again, with a bit of algebra, we can find out our value for the association constant. Let us look at protein ligand binding from a different perspective in understanding the fraction or the percent of the protein that has a ligand bound to it. So if we look at the specific way in which we have the ligand bound in the specific binding curve, we understand that if we have a specific fraction or a ligand bound to it, we know that when this reaches 0.5, we have the value of our dissociation constant. The curve is hyperbolic in nature, indicating the fraction of the ligand bound, X being the ligand concentration, and Z that represents the dissociation constant or the inverse of the association constant. Along these lines, if we consider an experiment where we have for a given protein the binding affinity for its ligand that is given as 5 into 10 to the minus 5 molar at pH five at 25 degrees centigrade. If we want to know the concentration of the ligand, that is half of the protein bound, which indicates that this is the dissociation constant. So the concentration of the ligand bound to half of the protein that is equal to Kd is equal to one by Ka that gives us two into 10 to the minus six molar, that is two micromolar. If we now have some additional information about our protein, say that if the pH was increased to 7, the Kd raised to 30 micromolar and is the protein stronger or weaker at this pH change? So the concentration of the ligand that we found in the previous case bound to half of the protein corresponded to the dissociation constant. Now we have this at 2 micromolar. Now, if the pH is raised to 7, we have that the Kd is 30 micromolar. Now, we know that a higher Kd indicates a lower affinity. So, this means that the binding is weaker at pH 7. So, given instances like this, we are able to understand the binding capabilities 
of our proteins, we are able to understand their binding at different pH values and have an assessment of how we would like to design ligands that could bind to proteins effectively. In another example, let us look at antigen antibody binding. The binding of an antibody to its antigen we know is a very strong binding and this was studied in another equilibrium dialysis experiment where the antibody concentration was one micromolar. The initial and equilibrium antigen concentrations have been given in the table here. We want to know how many binding sites there are present and the KD, that is the dissociation constant for binding. Now to do this, we need to plot a scattered plot as we have learned in one of the previous lectures. What we have is we have this linear equation and we have to plot mu by L versus mu that from the, slope of, from the slope of which we will get the value of minus Ka. So this is where we are plotting it. So the slope is minus Ka and we get the intercept. Now, if we look at this scattered plot, we have to do a bit of calculations in order to find the nu by L and the nu value, which we now have to plot. So with the knowledge of the total Ag available, and the Ag free plus the Ag bound, knowing that the antigen, total antigen concentration is what is free and what is bound together, we can find out the amount bound. And the definition of the new is the amount of ligand bind bound to the total amount of macromolecule, which in this case is the antibody. So given our plot of nu by L, nu by L versus nu, we will get this plot for nu by L versus nu given the values in the table. What we see from this value is that the equation that we get or the information that we get from the X intercepts gives us the number of binding sites and the slope is equal to minus Ka from our information here. So, if we do a bit of calculations here, we will see that we have found that the x-intercept gives us the number of binding sites, which is equal to 2. From the slope, we get the negative of the association constant minus Ka. Now, when we look at the slope on the scatter plot, we therefore get minus 5 micromolar inverse which means that the association constant Ka is given as 5 micromolar inverse equal to 5 into 10 to the 6 mole inverse. So we know that the dissociation constant is the reciprocal of the association constant. So from this, we can get the value of Kd that follows to be 0.2 into 10 to the minus 6 molar, that is 2 into 10 to the minus 7 so this gives us an indication of how we can use the scattered plot to find out the number of binding sites and the association and dissociation constants of protein ligand binding. In Now we look at another aspect of protein ligand binding in the sense that we have the protein binding multiple ligands. If they bind all of them simultaneously, we call this infinite cooperativity. So we have P, we have NL, and we have PLN formed in the complex formation of multiple ligands. So the protein molecule in this case has an all or none situation where either all its binding sites are empty or all are occupied, which indicates that there are no intermediates. PL1, PL2, etc. So if we look at the association with this, the chemical reaction therefore is P plus NL giving us PLN and Y as we considered in the previous can be the fraction of binding sites which are occupied. Now if we can actually show that a plot of this log y by 1 minus y versus log l will give a straight line with a slope equal to n for binding with infinite cooperativity, which says that all of our ligands bind together to the protein. So let us see how this works. This is our association constant where 
by the law of mass action, we have P, L, N, and P and L raised to N as the two reactants. Then we can look at a rearrangement of this separate equation, and what we get is we get a fraction bound. So this is the amount of bound ligand, and this is the amount of protein that we have. So we get the fraction bound with the ligand in this case, which is defined by our y. So we can rearrange this equation to give us what 1 minus y is, and from that, we can do a bit of algebra to determine that 1 minus y corresponds to the concentration of the protein, free protein, divided by the concentration of the free protein, plus that is bound to the ligand. So y by 1 minus y will give us this expression, which will work out to a specific expression which we get, which is log y by 1 minus y, n log of the ligand concentration versus plus the log k. So based on this, if we plot log y by 1 minus y versus log l, we will get a straight line with a slope that is equal to n. Let us see how this looks. This is called the Hill equation. So we have log y by 1 minus y equal to h log l minus log d. We will see what this h means in a moment. Kd is the dissociation constant. y is the fraction of the enzyme with substrate bound. And y by 1 minus y is the fraction of the binding sites which are occupied for the enzyme binding substrate. So now if we look at three cases, if H is equal to 1, then the enzyme exhibits no cooperativity as it is called. The cooperative mean, cooperativity factor means that the binding of one ligand facilitates the binding of the other ligand to the binding site. So if H is equal to N, then the enzyme exhibits perfect cooperativity, saying that the number of binding sites are occupied immediately by. So the enzyme in this case will be fully bound to the substrate if we are looking at an enzyme substrate situation, or the protein fully bound with the ligand. And But this is not usually observed in reality. In reality, we have a value that is between 1 and n, then we say that the enzyme of the protein exhibits a degree of cooperativity. For example, hemoglobin that has four binding sites, which we will see in a subsequent lecture, shows us an H of about 3. If now we work on this Hill equation, looking at a Hill plot, and see how we can work on a specific example. So if we have a protein P with an unknown number of binding sites, say with the L, the cooperativity has been investigated by monitoring the fraction of the sites occupied with free ligand concentration. We want to know the cooperativity of binding and also the number of binding sites, the minimum number of binding sites of this protein. So given that we know the fraction of binding sites that are occupied at the specific free ligand concentrations that we have here, let us work to find out the table that needs to be constructed to get our plot. So we have y by and l, and we need to find log y by 1 minus y and this value here. And what we will get is from the slope, we will get the value of h. So if we plot the graph, this is the observed plot that we get for the data shown on the left. What this means now is we, it, we need to find out what h is. h turns out to be, from the linear part of the curve, a value of 2.3. So what do we mean by this? This means that the cooperativity is the slope in the linear range that comes out to be 2.3, and the maximum possible cooperativity, infinite cooperativity, has a value equal to the number of binding sites. But in this case, the cooperativity has to be less than or equal to n. n means there's this infinite cooperativity. So the number of binding sites also must be an integer. And what this indicates that the minimum number of binding sites is 3. 
And this being a cooperative nature of the order of the value of H being 2.3 indicates that there is some cooperativity in the binding of this ligand with the protein. That means that there, once one ligand molecule bounds, this will help the other ligand molecules bind to it. What we have looked at in the series in this module are the types of protein ligand interactions, the kinetics and thermodynamics of protein ligand interactions, followed by experimental techniques in protein ligand interactions, and in the previous lecture, theoretical analysis of the protein ligand interactions in terms of docking methods and other methodologies. And in the final lecture in this module, we have looked at specific types of plots, what we can do from an equilibrium dialysis experiment with actual data, how we plot a scattered plot to determine the number of binding sites, and a hill plot from a hill equation to determine the cooperativity of binding. This ends this module five that dealt with protein ligand interactions. The references have been given in each of the lectures, which are also listed here. Thank you.